Hey there, honey bunnies. Welcome to episode 112 of your Sovereign Storytellers podcast with your host, Michelle Wolf. This episode, um, I want to talk about toxic productivity, which I didn't realize was a thing. Where have I been? I don't know, doing things. But what happened is, I, if you follow me on Facebook, I shared a pretty long post about this. And in that, um, you know, of course, COVID has thrown us all off and made us have to <laughs> just, it's made us have to do so damn much, right? Some painful things, some good things come out of it. Uh, and, and even though reevaluating your entire life is painful, it's also good. Um, generally speaking, people have to go through times like that where everything falls apart and you have to step back and take a review of your life and figure out, you know, are you on the path you want to be on or is it time to make a change? But generally speaking, the whole world doesn't go through that process at the same time. (laughs) So that's the difference is we're, we're going through one of those everything falling apart, rug snatched out from under us moments as a collective, as a globe. So, of course, everyone going through it at the same time to whatever degree is increasing the intensity, and it's hard. So, there are ebbs and flows in business. And in the ebb, you generally are looking over your content and thinking about what other content might be ready to come forward or revisiting your materials and working on yourself and, you know, doing the things that you do to try to be the best you can be. However, in this ebb, for the last, what, are we coming up on, like, forever? It feels like forever. (laughs) A long time over a year. Um, Nothing has been interesting. Nothing uh, that I normally would do really calls me or is satisfying to me. I'm a pretty busy bee. I've always got something going. Um, I'm always creating something, writing something. I never watch TV without some sort of project in my hands or a book or a journal. Um, uh, and I'm always doing new crafts or looking for a new crochet or knit patterns. You know, I'm just busy like that. And when I uh, moved, and then uh, allergies and all the and all the COVID and all the stuff, I just noticed that everything sort of started falling away, which I'm aware of that process. And so I thought, well, okay. I go through these periods of things falling away and nothing is interesting and everything is flat and gray. Um, And then, you know, within a few weeks or so, something comes out of that. Like, it's sort of the death rebirth cycle. I go into the death where everything is blah or things start just breaking, falling apart, sometimes literally breaking. I'll go through spells of dropping every dish I pick up and I know, oh, it's that time again. (laughs) So I go outside and I lay around and I take it easy and try to just take a break. But this time it has just gone on and on and on and on and on and on. And so I booked a session with um, Heather Westmoreland. If you've never had a session with her, I highly recommend it. She's been my apprentice or bad one, my client, now my coach, sometimes all the things at once. But, you know, we were talking about how the whole planet is in somewhat of that goo state, you know, the the old butterfly metaphor of, you, you know, the butterfly turns into goo and it's not um, a fun process. I don't, I wouldn't even begin to imagine what it's like But even symbolically what it's like, it feels pretty terrible because you don't know what to do with it, right? So I get a lot of requests for readings with um, 
the question of nothing is interesting and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, okay, I may be able to pull through something for you with the readings I do from the Crystal Entity Group um, that comes through a Herkimer Diamond. It's Celestial Crystal Report, if you haven't seen that yet from me. But a channeling will come through, and often they won't answer questions like that because those are the questions we ask when we feel insecure, when we're in the goo, and we, we want direction, and we want to know what to do, and we can't figure it out, Our so our mind is just suspended in space. And we don't like it. It's really unpleasant. And we are raised in a culture of toxic productivity where you're not any good if you aren't producing, 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 producing. Make money in your sleep. <laughs> it's just awful. Go, go, go. Do, do, do. If you take a nap, you're lazy. If you take a vacation and you don't check your email, you're a bad employee. You know, all these things. Just I'm telling you, just Google. You may already know because I think I've just have not heard it, probably because I wasn't ready to hear it, because I've been a high level, I'm an A student in the toxic productivity workaholic world. So to me, it's like, well, of course you should be productive. Why would you sit and watch TV and not make something? <laughs> Why aren't you thinking of how you can uh, monetize your creations? Why aren't you, yeah, la, 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 la. So in the falling away in the goose state, I was saying, putting words to it, is that it does feel like swimming in the ocean, which I really don't like. I don't like the ocean because it's out of control, right? You can't control. I'm not a strong swimmer in the first place. So there are practical reasons I should not be swimming in the ocean because I don't know what I'm doing. I was not raised around a whole lot of swimming activities. So... But what I really don't like about it is this feeling that there's no edge. In a swimming pool, there's an edge. Even if you manage to end up in the deep end of the pool and it's 12 foot deep, but it's not really that wide. So you can, or I can, I can flop myself over to the edge. <laughs> I can swim enough to stay alive in a swimming pool. I don't trust that I can swim enough to well enough to stay alive in the ocean if something, you know, if a tide caught me or, or whatever those scary ocean things are. <laughs> but it's like that. Like and for those of you going through it in this falling away kind of goose state, um it feels like there's no edge. You can't see the horizon. You can't see any kind of finish line. You can't feel any kind of boundary. Because in some sense, you have literally been snatched up and you are suspended in space. You're held above your life, apart from the mental constructs, your conditioned self. You're separated from it. Something gets in between you and it. And you're, uh, you know, you have those awakening moments, which are exciting, but also scary because you have to start to get used to the fact that there is no edge. All the edges and boxes that we think we have are mental constructs. Like we've put them in place. We were taught how to create a system of rules and mental constructs for how the world is supposed to be. And here's the edges. And if you go beyond the edges, you know, you're going to fall off the earth. <laughs> beyond here, there be dragons when you cross the edges, right? Which is a lot of what my work is. People get into upheaval and they lose their edges. And they're, if they stay with it, they go through it. And they go, oh, that was that edgeless, suspended in space goo place. Okay, next time I'll have a frame of reference for what that is. And I'll know that I just have to need, hang out there and take the time to review my life and think about things and take an objective, like, hawk eye view of my world. So it can be very deeply transformative when you don't freak out. Uh, and when you stay with it and not lash out at people and run away 
or just go into hiding or shut down completely. If you stick with it, there is another side to it. And I'll acknowledge it takes a lot of courage to stick with it because this level of it, or that I don't like to use the word level because it sounds like better than, less than. I'll say stage. This developmental stage of it was challenging because it's it hasn't ended. I'm I'm comfortable because I have a template. I have a frame of reference. Oh, I've been through the goose state. I know that. I know what that's like. I'm supposed to do this and this and this. And then it'll something cool's going to be on the other side of this. So I can be patient. But it, it wasn't it's not ending. I would say it's probably coming to somewhat of a shifting and changing point as of today. Um, but uh, we don't have a frame of reference for it. So worldwide, a lot of us are going through a different kind of no edge space of lost in the ocean, suspended in space, can't find your way, can't figure out what to do. Because our, our the normal things that we would hang on to, a lot of them are out of reach for the moment. We, we can't just move through the world with the casual, unconscious freedom that we had. And we have to grieve that at some point. Um, but for a lot of people, they're like, oh my gosh, I have spent my entire life focused on work. I think about work. I talk about work. All my friends are from work. Um, and so having that swept out from under you, if you're feeling like that, I just want to let you know you're not alone. And it's still the same. Even though it's going on longer for a lot of us, this no edge space. If you don't know, I'll tell you. And if you do know, I'll remind you, this is a normal response to things being in upheaval. When you lose a job, when your relationship changes, when you experience a triggering event, um, you're swept off the ledge <laughs> into the ocean. Off you go, swim around down there <laughs> for a while in the ocean and see what happens. So again, the difference is it's global. And it's ongoing. <laughs> and now we've got Delta variant stuff and Lambda variants and all the variants. So what do we do in this state? Well, first of all, take a look at toxic productivity. Are you busy all the time because you just have so much energy and you love being busy? There's times that I've done that. Aren't you just creating and creating and creating and it feels amazing? But then there's times where we're creating and creating because we think we have to. Or we're caretaking because we think we have to. We're doing these things and pushing ourselves to keep going, uh, being productive, because we, we, we are in a box, we're in a mental construct that says we have to. But that's a false state. That's something we were told. We were trained that because we live in a capitalist society. And if you're not being productive, the guy in the dumb cowboy hat with the dick-shaped rocket isn't making money off of you. I'm not bitter. I just want to say that. <laughs> I'm not bitter. <laughs> but I know I'll never be that kind of wealth because I can't, I won't do what it takes. You have to do things to people to get to that level of wealth. Anywho, we were trained that way from birth. Perform, get the A, go to school, pay attention, do your homework, achieve, 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 achieve. Oof, that's falling away. We can't achieve, 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 achieve. We have no offices to go to. You're not working at the pace that you did work if you've been moved out of the office and you're working remotely. At a minimum, you have cut away your commuting time. So there's extra time in the day and it can feel really uncomfortable if you're used to being on the go productive all the time, always checking your email, telling yourself that that means you care. I saw this, someone commented on a post and 
said, I, I work 12 hours and sit in the parking lot way after the building's closed because I care. Mm. Well, when you burn out in five years, who's going to care for the people that you care for? The agency you're working for is not going to care. You're replaceable. The people that you could have served had you paced yourself will not know what they're missing. So, you know, we have this distorted stuff around producing. When I told myself to stop trying to force production, I got to where turning on my computer was making me physically nauseated. That's what really got my attention. I love my computer. I love my computer. It's my it's my fun toy. I should need a new one because my fun toy's getting slow. But I was I couldn't bear it. I can't bear to write. I haven't made a podcast episode. I love my podcast. I love this environment. Be able to just come and talk to you and share with you what's on my mind in case it's helpful. Um. But I haven't made a podcast episode in a long time. I want to say the last podcast episode was in May. End of May, first part of June. That's a long time for me. So the computer making me sick really got me. I was like, man, something is going on here. And I haven't been able to get out of bed. I look forward to my client appointments and my groups and uh, energy comes if you're, if you're a human design person, when the energy comes for the activity you're contemplating, it's the right one to do. So if I think about meeting with a client or doing a celestial crystal report or, Oh, my group is at three that like energy rises because those things are important to me and they're in alignment those things are still in alignment but when I would think about doing a podcast tank okay I should write tank I've been writing some of the book about talking to the dead and there's been energy for that but there's just been these very little micro bursts of energy taking a walk I can get the energy for that but doing anything that falls in the my mind's definition of productive, make a blanket, do something. Don't just sit and watch TV for fuck's sake. You can't just sit and read a book, blah, 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 all the crap our mind says. That's actually exactly what we need to be doing. If there's no energy, we need to be setting good boundaries now, obviously, if you have children and things like that, there's. I'm not saying ignore the actual things that have to be done. If you're a mom or a dad, there are things that have to be done. If you have animals, there are things that have to I mean, you have to feed them. <laughs> you have to take care of them. You have to, or you need to find them a new home. I mean, technically, you don't have to, but, you know, I, let's not do that. <laughs> If you really are in such a state, you can't take care of your animals, please find them a new home. Kids, I don't know. I don't think you can go find them a new home, but (laughs) let's not be ridiculous. I'm not, you know, don't take my words and go to the extreme end of the mountaintop with them. But whenever possible, what I'm saying is we need to examine what we're not saying no to, even when there's no energy to do it. It can be scary if you're a content creator and an entrepreneur and you're running your own show out here. It can be scary to stop producing content. But what I've been telling people, uh, my clients, and um, I think I may have said this to the group, Unfuckable with Warriors, that's going on right now, is you want to be doing those things by choice. If you're watching TV and you want to crochet, it's really, I don't know if you're a crocheter, but it's really pleasant to watch TV show and crochet or knit or do some sort of little thing with your hands. I used to even just squeeze clay. I used to do something with my hands. But I don't want to feel that like I'm crocheting because if I don't, I'm a useless POS who's sitting on the couch watching TV. Right, that's not a good reason to be creating a blanket 
while you're watching TV. That That's compulsion, right? That's conditioned response. That's if I'm not doing something every moment of every day, I'm worthless. My life has no value. I've spoken about this before around money, like examining how the number in your bank account tells you, controls you, and tells you if you're a good person or not. Because we're twisted up as fuck about that. The same thing happens with diet, dieting or if you've ever struggled with your weight or your body. The number on the scale in the morning, we give it the power to tell us how we're going to feel. Oh, the number's that? Well, you're going to feel like shit all day. You're going to struggle with food all day. Whatever, however you that shows up for you. Oh, the number is what you want it to, wanted it to be? Okay, great. You, you're allowed to feel good today. What the fuck? I broke that one a long time ago. The money one is still, eh, still a bit of a wonky challenge. If the money is the amount I think it should be, my mind. This is all mind stuff, right? What my mind says it should be. If that number's there, I feel fine. I feel safe and secure. These things are changing, but this is how it was even like a month ago. If the number's not what I think it should be, I panic. So in a sense, the bank account is saying, oh, you're allowed to feel safe and secure today because the number is blah, blah. Oh, today you're not allowed to feel safe and secure. You need to go panic and go create a bunch of stuff and spin around in your head and ruin your entire day. Sorry, that's the breaks when the number says this. Again, what the fuck? That's a horrible way to live. And this goose state, no edge place is part of what we're, so many of us are going through. to ca- So that can catch our attention. So we can notice that, oh my God, I don't get employee reviews anymore. I don't get pats on the head and gold stars and I don't know what to do about that. Our value is coming from our supervisors, our paychecks, our body shape and size. That's not a good place to get your value from. People are adrift because all the outlets for gold stars and validation are pretty well gone. It's a little different having been online for so many years. I don't get employee reviews. (laughs) Sometimes I tell myself, hey, great job. You deserve a raise. You know, in other days, it's quite the opposite. But so that part was already gone. But the toxic productivity and the workaholicism stuff and the it brings me, keeps it bringing me back to what is the value of a life? And I'm actually going to make a separate episode for that. What is the value of a life? <clears throat> Because that's what it all comes back to. So maybe we could consider this a part one. And I'm going to do um, part two immediately after this. While the energy is here because Lord knows if it tanks, I don't know when it's going to come back. So my recommendation is, are you going through that? Are you uncomfortable and adrift and, you know, being cranky with yourself, lashing out at others, overreacting, acting out of character, uh, eating too much, sleeping too much, like is all these indicators that you may even be questioning. Like I was starting to say, maybe I need to go do another round of antidepressants. Like maybe it's time because this isn't going away. But as soon as I had that, a coaching session for myself, coaches need to be coached. You can tell when they're not getting their own coaching because they go out and try and coach other people without permission. (laughs) Um, Get your own coaching. You'll never not need it. If you're working with people, you will always need to be doing your own internal growth, which requires that you have a coach or a therapist or somebody you can bounce this off of. But once I verbalized it all and got reminded that, oh, hey, that's that goose state. And I was like, oh, fuck, you're right. But the difference is everyone's going through it. 
And it's going on and on for longer than I have a frame of reference for it. So whenever we hit that point where we don't have a template, we don't know what it's like to be wealthy. We don't know what it's like to be in the ideal relationship that we've been working toward for years. Like, we don't know what that stuff is like. This is why people who struggle with their weight tend to regain it back pretty quickly if they lose it suddenly because they haven't had time to get familiar with who they are as a fill in the blank. We don't know who we are as a country where all of a sudden we're so many people are working from home. All of a sudden, every day is a different set of data points that we have to take in and adjust to. It's all changing very, very quickly. And it bounces us around in our nervous system. So what to do? Evaluate. Talk it over with somebody and see, like, here's what I'm feeling Everything is coming into question. All of a sudden, the things that used to be meaningful for me don't have any meaning. I don't feel like I'm getting my gold star anywhere, <laughs> like I'm not being validated and I haven't learned how to validate myself. You know, this movement from everything outside telling me how I'm going to feel based on these mental constructs, shifting to, oh, I'm going to have to tell myself how I'm going to feel. I'm going to have to stay awake and conscious so that this person's behavior doesn't rock my world, so that the number in the bank account doesn't tell me how I'm going to feel today, so that the lack of a office space and a supervisor who can pat me on the head doesn't derail me. Where is my inside validation? Where is it? We don't know. A lot of people don't know. The heart of toxic productivity is external validation. We're taught from a little age, perform. If you're not performing, you have no value. If you aren't getting good grades, you have no value. It starts in kindergarten. If you can't tie your shoes by a certain age, ah, you have no value. <laughs> like... If you don't own a home, you have no value. My mom and I were talking about this the other day. Like in some cities, you don't expect to be a homeowner. There's no homes to own. People rent generation after generation. They rent. They don't own. Whereas, you know, growing up in Texas and probably a lot of other areas, the the uh, external validation that you're grown up and a responsible contributing member of society is that you're a homeowner. It doesn't matter if you're broke from owning a house or it makes no sense for you to own a house you should be renting. Your external validation, your stamp of approval is homeownership. So if you don't have that, you can feel like a piece of shit. So evaluate, talk it out, look at where do I get my feel good from? What happens in my life that makes me feel happy? And is that something that someone could take away? Or is that something that I can give myself? Safety is a sense you can give yourself, Matt Licata. The Unfuckable with Warriors groups is spending an enormous amount of time um going through upheaval and then practicing the tools of regulating your nervous system. Because it's never about the other person. Never. Ever. Because we are in control of our reactions. Uh, let me say that differently. We're in control of knowing what our reaction is. Then there may be some work to do before we can choose consciously a different reaction. Because so if we have nervous system stuff where we're in, we're we're not really in control. If we react, we're reacting from trauma and we aren't waiting and taking the time and getting advice and working on ourselves, like why why am I so upset and what is this about for me? If I take the other out of the equation, what is this about for me? then, you know, it's very hard to figure out. And a lot of us don't have that training. That's what that course is all about. Anyway, I'm wandering. Okay. 
reflect, evaluate, talk it over, find out the things in your life that make you feel good. Ask if those disappeared, if it's someone else's doing or a circumstance, if that disappeared, how would you find your sense of safety? How would you find your sense of having value? How would you know that you're okay if there was no one outside of you to look to, to tell you if you're okay or not? This is like next level sovereign storyteller stuff, right? Really pulling yourself out of the mix and looking at what am I dependent on to feel good? And is that coming from outside or am I giving it to myself inside, which means that I'm unfuckwithable, I'm sovereign. And we're not completely that, of course. We need community. We need each other. I'm talking about core level stuff here that when that's handled, all your relationships are by conscious choice. There's no codependency. There's no push-pull balancing off of each other because you're in there consciously you're taking care of your own needs you're self-responsible for your own reactions so you don't have to work those out and you know shit on other people to do it so yes we still need relationships and we can be conscious and sovereign and unfuckwithable within those relationships which means they're way more delightful and far more healthy okay i'm gonna stop there Let's come back with part two and uh, talk about the value of a life. How do we define that? Um, Okay, so in the meantime, if you want to check out any of the courses I have coming up, or uh, you can go to the website, thatmichellewolf.com forward slash warriors or forward slash holistic magic because that one's that's the six month one and it's open for enrollment both both of them are open for enrollment for a September start if you're interested in a celestial crystal report which is a channeled report where i sit down and say what does this person need to know and the crystalline group just Man, that shit's hard to explain. It just sort of flows through and out, and it's anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. That you can find at michellewolf.as.me forward slash celestial. All right, in the meantime, think less, feel more, and I'll come back at you with a part two. <laughs>